This afternoon we have the privilege of talking to Helen, Helen Hockey, um, who is an organist at St James's. Um, Helen, perhaps you'd like to tell us um, how you started um, playing the organ originally. Well, I was lucky enough to go to a school where we had an organ in the hall. And my piano mistress asked me if I'd like to learn the organ, and I thought it was a good idea. Uh, and I was about 14, 15 then. Um, I carried on after I left school having lessons, but unfortunately I took on an organist job because I needed to have a church to practice. Uh, before that, my father had to pay blowing fees in the various churches. You had um, bellows organs? Uh, yeah, but I mean, it was electric, but you had to pay half a crown an hour to use a decent organ. So when I left school, he said, well, you're on your own, which is you know, fair enough. Um, but getting an organist job meant that I had commitments to service, at least on a Sunday, mm -hmm. choir practice. I also had work. I also had boyfriends. So dancing, etc. You know, so I kept the organ job on, but stopped having the lessons. Mm. So I only got as far as my grade eight, and never took my letters, which I think I regret. But I've only ever been a hack organist, so it doesn't really matter, does it? <laughs> Ah, well, uh, I lived at Rowan's Castle for a long time and I had to sell my house and was going to move over here but in the meantime they were very short of an organist and I'd been coming over two, e two, evenings, uh, two Sunday evenings a month to help out but I was already playing at Rowan's in the morning services. So David Partridge came and sweethearted me as only he could <laughs> and I held out until he offered me um, you know, the proper salary for the job <laughs> and uh, so then I came here and I've been organist here for 18 19 years, Ooh. which seems like a long time really, but it's gone very quickly. Yes, yes, that's mm -hmm. right. Well, over the years, I mean, the very first organ I played was a little church, a little village organ, where I had a very strapping lad be the blower. And at times like harvest, uh, he would say he was only going to do two verses. Well, even we plow the fields and scatter has three. So there'd be a lot of whispering during the sermon on negotiating how many polo mints would equal the last verse. <laughs> And of course he then got clever and up the ante, um, so it was a packet of polos per service, you know. It was <laughs> um, so it's very different from organs now because the only other organ I know around here that can be hand pumped is the one at um, uh, Stansted Chapel, which is electrified. It's a little um, uh, chamber organ. Mm -hmm. It's electrified, but in fact it does have a hand pump. And um, a very good friend of mine's daughter was getting married there, and her fiancé was, well, to say he was uppity is being nice about him. And he'd been vaguely rude to my friend, very arrogant, and they were getting married there. So I said, would he be kind enough to help? with the organ because I needed a, someone to blow it. And I had all the stops out. I did as much as I could. I had him really thumping away on this. And then I said, perhaps you'd like to go downstairs and listen to it now, Paul, and switch the switch on. And we've never had any trouble with him since. <laughs> It was hilarious because it is quite hard work. Oh, You've got to get steam up and keep it up. Yeah. But um, that was nastiness, but it was fun. Mm -hmm. But now they're all electric, and if they don't work, if the electric is off, the organ is off. Um, yeah, well, the, we have a family service on the first Sunday of the month, and that's the band, and I play the piano for that. And um, we have a sung communion in the evening of the first, and then it's just ordinary communion, you know, sung Eucharist. <laughs>
we only have one evening service a month now, which is um, quite different from mm -hmm. how it used to be. When I started, it was two, if not three, services a day. Yeah. Uh, you sometimes had a sun communion followed by matins and an even song. Do you not have a harvest festival? Then? Oh, we have harvest festival, yeah. yes, but it's not it's not as big here as in more rural. We have tins of stuff. The children all bring tins, which is much more practical. But it doesn't it's have that lovely smell. smell of leeks and onions and, and the, rotten the cabbage. Marrow, really. That's right. Yeah. We do we do have those, just a few, but it's basically the children all bring tins and, and it's held on now on a family service. Mm -hmm. um, in the evening, we tend to um, you know sing something a bit harvesty. Well, we always sing We Plow the Fields and Scatter, but um, it's, it's not the sort of festival that you and I would remember it as, mm -hmm. as being loads and loads of apples and everybody bought produce. Now it's more stuff that can be distributed cleanly. Mm -hmm. I suppose it's, or perhaps it doesn't because human nature doesn't change, but years and years ago, the old ladies who used to get boxes of the produce and some of the flowers used to compare what, which boxes they'd had and moan. <laughs> Um, at Roland's Castle, we used to send most of our produce to um, St Petrox, which is a what well, was a home for old old men or men, you know, men of the road who had come in, um, and that was quite good. And we'd also send loads of jerseys and things like that down, so it was a proper, you know, before the winter. Yes. Um, but these huge vegetables look lovely, but you do need to have a lot of people to eat. Huge, a huge leak, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Pat Carter, who has won many prizes, she always donated prime huge vegetables for St John's. And I did ask her one year to give me stuff for here, um, but uh, I haven't kept it up since because, I, you know, well, <laughs> it's one of those things, isn't it? Uh, yes. Oh, well, this is again over the years. Um, this year, St James has been very, very poor, and Ems, uh, Rona, uh, Warblington, cut all that, Warblington has had loads and loads and loads of weddings, and I'm eaten up with jealousy because, of course, that's where organists make their money. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it, 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 it evens out. When the laws all changed and you could get married when you'd been divorced, that made a tremendous difference uh, because now a lot of people go to venues. You know, the whole yes. the whole laws all change. You you don't have to get married in church. You can get married in the motel, um, and you've got parking and you've got the reception there, and it's like a big package. Um, in St James, we tend to get very much Emmersworth families. Um, it's quite normal to have people who are married and buried here and then their grandchildren come along and it's the same sort of pattern you know yes, yes. which i think is quite nice I um i mean on funerals we had a funeral recently and there were about oh, 300 350 people there for a, he was an emsworth man he wasn't very old admittedly if you get to 90 the numbers are a bit reduced um but uh, i think warblington is a what i would call a pretty church and a hundred people in Warblington and it's full. A hundred people in St. James and you're sort of rattling around a bit. Um, but uh, yeah, no, we've had some very good weddings here. Uh, I always smile when the bride is given away by a son who's about seven, I think now. <laughs> and things have changed dramatically on dresses, of course. Um, years and years ago, an older bride would wear a suit or something. But now it's all, doesn't matter what your age is, you get dished up. I don't mean if you're 60, but you know, you get dished up in your white dress with uh, all the accoutrements. And uh, it doesn't seem to matter about the cost either. It's quite amazing. And the stationery, summer wedding stationery is beautiful. And I think, well, it's, it's a lot of money people pay for their weddings now. It's good they still want to get married, but I think it's really just a wonderful uh, day that they all think, think, you know, it's just, and the fellows as well. It just, it's a marvellous day for a party because so many of them live together. 
we had one in last year, lovely couple, and they had a little boy. And obviously Gran or something was looking after him. Anyhow, after they were married, they were just coming down from signing the register, and this child was beginning to squeak a lot. And um, I heard the bride say, I'm not having him, he'll ruin my dress. <laughs> and the father just picked him up on his way down to the wedding march or whatever they went out to and carried him down on his arm. It was absolutely lovely. Particularly the bride's remark, because she was so right, you know. I mean, you know what, a year old baby can make a, a lot of dribble, oh. can't they? <laughs> yeah. Weddings can be quite a lot of hard work because sometimes the happy couple want you to play just about everything that's appropriate. And then, of course, choose something quite different, you know. <laughs> Have you had some bizarre requests? Um, not really. I, I think the biggest, if you want the change from when I started, um, the biggest change is the lack of hymns. Um, when, if I say 50 years ago, I'm doing well, more than that really, but then it would be Praise My Soul, it would be Love Divine or you know, that sort of a solid hymn that everybody knew. <laughs> now, um, All Things Bright and Beautiful goes across the board for weddings and funerals. And a couple of years ago, I had quite a joke going that, you know, a pastor would ring you up and say, can you do so and so? And you'd say, well, I know it's All Things Bright and Beautiful. <laughs> How did you know? <laughs> you know? Uh, and for funerals, we used to have Jesus Lives and various Easter sort of hymns, All Things Bright and Beautiful. And of course, Primmond. But weddings, it's very, very poor. They, it, I think it's because they don't have hymns in schools anymore. And so you'll have I danced in the morning, which actually is quite a hard hymn to sing, you know, the Shakers tune. <laughs> um, and you'll have Give Me Joy. Well, that's okay, but it's very lightweight and shine, Jesus, shine. The, all these things, are, there's nothing wrong with them. It's just the generation of grannies or aunties who were there won't know them because they're all from the, from the last, you know, if the bride's under 30, we'll say. I think it's probably uh, that sort of era. I mean, my children were, still had hymns and they're in their 40s. So I think it's the 30s and under who have now no sort of repository in their brains of hymns. And it's um, what's happening in some hymns is they're choosing, they've got these words, I, you know, we trust in one another or something, but they do it to tunes like I vow to thee my country. So they're just putting new words to an old tune. Well, that is quite helpful for the congregation because the older ones know the tune. Mm. Uh, but some of the modern ones and, and the congregations just don't sing because they just, well, just don't. If you think of a wedding, it's a 50-50 game, isn't it? They're 50% or at least 50 years and older. If you think of anybody's aunt or, yes. you know, and then there's youngsters, and then there's the ones contemporaries with small children. So, yeah, you know, I think my advice usually is well, put in some hymn that your granny will know, because then you're gonna, you're gonna satisfy 50% <laughs> of your guests. They'll say, at least we knew that one. <laughs>